Now, standing together, let's turn to 84.
Thank you for that. Good morning. So glad that you're here. Take your Bibles with me, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, one more time. Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah three hundred years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Thank you. you may be seated for our time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thrill over even just a cursory reading of your word, let alone the privilege that is ours to be diligent students aided by the Holy Spirit of God who has tabernacled in our hearts since the moment of salvation. God, we are an equipped people, and because of that, we're without excuse. And so part of our heart cry, even at this juncture, is that we would be greatly impacted, changed, transformed again today, this hour, by your truth. We've come to worship you and exalt you and you alone. Our eyes are fixed on the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, I pray that every aspect of the service would bring honor and glory to you and that you would be pleased with us, including our giving. And what joy it is to give back to you a portion of all that you've entrusted to our care especially with a view to your having given us your all. Lord, we have every motivation to love and serve you, and I pray towards that end. And we're careful to pray again this morning for those who may be here or within the sound of this voice who have not yet put personal faith and trust in the one and only Savior. I pray that today, this hour, would be the day, the hour of their salvation. Do a great work. In every heart, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. songs centering our thoughts on Christ and hope desire to be like him. Let's stand together again and turning to 132. Now we're only going to sing this first verse so children you can depart right now if your parents want you to.
that make my faith to stand. Lord, I believe in you. I'll always believe in you. Though I can't see you with my eyes, deep in my heart, your presence I find. Thank you, Deborah. Very nice. What a wonderful song of commitment. It, it, it's really a pledge. And uh, we, we believe in the God whom we have not seen, and further we love him. But the day is coming, we believe, very soon when we will see God in the flesh, in the form of the Son of God, and we'll see him face to face. What a great day. That will be until then, the just shall live by faith. Let's pray together. Lord's song is so appropriate for us, even as we open up the pages of your book. And it was neat to listen to the songs, again challenging, and a, a good word of commitment on the part of God's people. Our 
pledging before both God and man our belief in God and our devotion and love to him. And then with a view to recognizing that this earthly sojourn is not the end, but really just the beginning of a life that goes on and on for all of eternity. And as we cite that together, we are instantaneously reminded of the crucial import of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one and only Savior from sin, and how important it is that we have a personal relationship with him. Lord, I pray that as we look into your word, that the Spirit of God would once again be our guide, that he would turn the light on as he so faithfully does, and then that we would allow him to prep our hearts for the reception of your truth, that your word would be like a seed that's planted deep into our hearts and subsequently brings forth fruit, yea, much fruit. That's our prayer. We pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> our study in Genesis has brought us face to face with an Old Testament patriarch by the name of Enoch. Although, and we've recognized this many times together, although not a whole lot is said of Enoch in the scriptures by way of volume, what is said is very significant and revealing. So much so that we have spent four sessions focusing in on Enoch, and we need a fifth this morning to finish our considerations of this very special and unique man. Um, we have yet to consider the last two phrases or statements of verse 24 of Genesis 5. You know our text is Genesis 5. Our focus this morning is on the last part of verse 24, where after uh, the narrative informs us that Enoch walked with God, we in turn are informed that he, Enoch, was not, for God took him. Uh, there's a beautiful flow to verse 24, the unfolding of a wonderful story. In fact, I don't think that there is any more wonderful story than this, that a person is walking with God and then he is not, and the reason why he is not is because God took him. It's a great story. My proposal to you this morning is that Enoch's story is really the story of each and every one of God's people, and even that ought to highlight how desperate our need is for having a personal relationship with the great creator God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our story is really Enoch's story. And, and it ought to be, and it must be. You're walking with God, and then all of a sudden you are not. And the reason why you are not is because God has taken you. By the way, I remind you, and this reflects on some of what God has taught us already in regard to this awesome statement in connection with Enoch that he walked with God. Thank you. you. You have taught me. You have given me further insight into the significance of this wonderful biblical phrase. In fact, it really goes deeper than that. I, I don't know that we're going to be the same going forward. I don't know that we're going to forget the high calling of God on our lives in regard to this practically being true of us, that you and I are in the process of walking with God. But I want to interject here the fact, something that we saw as we discoursed our way through that, that when you walk with God, that makes you a prophet. And I'm not talking about where you are foretelling a new thing that's not necessary but I am emphasizing with that the fact that you are forthtelling all that God has revealed to you in his word. You are forthtelling the blessed gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and then all of the doctrine, blessed doctrine, that God has discoursed in the B-I-B-L-E. You are a prophet 
you see the man, the woman, the young person who walks with God, God reveals his stuff to him. So if you're walking with God, you are a prophet, and we ought not to forget that. Let's take a little closer look. Again, awesome. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. We spent a number of sessions coming to appreciate and understand what exactly it means to walk with God. And now the narrative tells us, and he, Enoch, was not. That phrase, he was not, in the English comes from a single word in the Hebrew, ayun, and it means nothing. Sounds kind of funny. And Enoch walked with God and nothing. So what in the world does that mean? Well, inherent in the term, and this is so neat, you'll have to pursue it on your own, both to substantiate and then to revel in its realities. A couple of interesting nuances to this particular Hebrew word. One inherent in the word is a sense of query. That is, it begs the question, where? So as you read the narrative initially, and you envision, because your mind pictures everything, it's kind of neat. As we were working our way through uh, Genesis 5, and we came to verses 21 through 24, and especially this idea that Enoch was walking with God, and then boom, he was not. You pictured all of that in your mind, and, and, and what governed the picture was a question, where did he go? And I'm telling you that the word that we have here actually warrants you asking that question. And it sort of creates an interesting picture and a scene for us that we probably don't go far enough in exploring. The word itself begs the question, where, where did Enoch go? He was here one moment and boom, now he's gone. Where did he go? He was right here, people would say, and now he is not. Nothing. Where did he go? You have the idea. But there's a second nuance to the truth. By the way, I thought you'd be a little bit more excited even about that, but you stick with me, some good things are coming. There's a second nuance to the, to the word as well. Not only does it beg the question where, but, but, but the word signals that there was, again, something you've already pictured, the word signals that there was a search. In, in, in fact, you'll... Um, find a New Testament text, it's very interesting, that we will pursue in just a moment. But then this Hebrew word, the New Testament is about to substantiate what I'm telling you semantically from the Hebrew term uh, ayin. Not only does it have inherent in it the sense of query where you would ask the question, where, where in this case did it go? But inherent in the term is that there was a search that was conducted. By the way, for those of you that have already envisioned that this may have something to do, at least type, typologically, to the rapture of the church, you've wondered what's going to happen when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and gathers unto himself his bride. Well, I think we're seeing by way of type some of that here in Genesis chapter 5. Where... I, I don't know that you can overemphasize this. We, we would say, Enoch was right here. We, we'd say, I, I, was, I, I was sitting here talking to him. He was right here. Where did he go? In the modern vernacular, we would have put out an all-points bulletin with this detailed description. Hey, this guy is missing. You need to help us find this fella. You envision I'm too old. You envision someone running in and out of rooms and different places and saying, where is Enoch? Where did he go? We just saw him. He was right here. All of that and a whole lot more is invested divinely into a single word. Enoch was right here. And then, boom. Nothing. Where did he go. I'm telling you, that's one exciting story. I I'm telling you that you will not find a better story than this. That a man, a woman, a young person walked with God. And then, boom, nothing. Where did he go? God took him. 
It's the bestest story in the whole wide world. Any story, listen, any story that you and I would make up concerning our lives would be inferior to the story of Enoch, that he walked with God, and then nothing. Where did he go? God took him. I I, I want to take you over to the New Testament uh, parallel passage, Hebrews uh, 11. This is so neat, and uh, you you guys are, are familiar with this text too, but boy, it's important that we Put, put these together. So we're turning to the New Testament book of Hebrews. We're heading to chapter 11 and we'll be looking at and we'll be reading and considering some things in verse 5. Hebrews 11, 5. By faith, here is this hall of fame of faith. We just love this. And guess who's here? Enoch. And, and guess, we, we believe Paul is the human author here, inspired by the Spirit of God. And guess guess who Paul's going to focus in on? It's the Old Testament patriarch Enoch. It's the Enoch of Genesis 5, verses 21 through 24. And this is what we read in verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated, what a neat word, that he should not see death. Isn't it interesting that God spells that out for us, that Paul spells it out? He was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. It's going to be hard to read that verse and not just spend the next three sessions here in Hebrews 11.5 but actually if you've been with us a while back we did that. But you see that phrase and he was not found. Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found. It's the very same word that we have in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 8. I'm taking you to Christmas. I'm taking you to Christmas time. I'm taking you back to Matthew 2 and verse 8 in your mind's eye. You've heard of Christmas in July. This is Christmas in, what month is this? This is Christmas in September. I'm taking you back to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 8 where Herod the Great, is speaking to the wise men who had come to worship the Christ child. And he says to them, go to Bethlehem, listen to the terminology, because we have our very same word here. Go to Bethlehem, search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him. Listen, there was that kind of search. What you've envisioned as happening by way of, of seeing in regard to Enoch having walked with God, having walked, having, as, as he is walking with God, and then boom, nothing. Where did he go? Oh, God took him. There, there was a search that unfolded to try to find Enoch. Where did he go? That kind of search. People diligently searching for Enoch. Where did he go? He was here one moment, and boom, the very next moment, he is gone. There's something else here in the Hebrew text that I I want you to consider. It revolves around the word translated. Actually, the word is used two times in this little text. Enoch was translated that he should not see death. I can't even begin to express to you what a tender and terrific term that is. Translated. We have a great translation here. The the word in, in the original means to transfer, to transport, to translate. But what we miss in our English is that it's a compound word. In fact, the root word is tithemi, which normally means to place. But attached to it, it, by way of prefix, is a preposition, meta, which means with. We miss this in our English translation. Please don't miss it any longer. Whatever transportation God is talking about here, whatever um, 
transfer God is referring to here, whatever is being transported here, you can be assured that God is accompanying and doing it himself. That's why, and this takes us back to our text in Genesis 5 and gives us further and stronger warrant for emphasizing the fact that Enoch was walking with God and then nothing. Where did he go? Answer, God. Listen, God himself took Enoch. I don't know if you... um, I don't know if I'll express this to you very well. I I am ready to recognize with you that there is some mystery in in what I'm pursuing with you uh, presently. But I reflected on this, and I think that it holds water. Every single thing that God does for and to you is personal. It's always with God. God doesn't, and I, I'm, I, I will reflect uh, with you in just a moment on the great doctrine of angelology, but listen, God does not entrust his dealings with you to anyone else. He is the source of the dealings with you. It is always with God. That's why we have his promise, he will never forsake us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Why? Because God is always with us. I understand from a theological standpoint that it reflects on the great doctrine of God's omniscience, but don't miss the personal nature of the thing. Don't miss the heart warm in knowing that God is always with us, that God is always with his people, that he always is personally superintending whatever is happening with God's people. That's why when you and I are even in trouble, we have his promise that he is in it with us. Matters not where you go, what you are doing, God is with you. The only thing I can think of that might lend itself a little bit against that is what you know, and I'm happy to talk about this for just a moment, what you know about what takes place at the death of the saint. We, we know that the death of the saint is precious in the sight of the Lord, right? The psalmist teaches us that. What we learn from Luke chapter 16, the end of the verse in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, that we even have an angelic escort. What an awesome thing. But I want you to see something with me. That isn't all that happens. We really get the fuller picture when we get to Acts chapter 7. Sorry, i got to remember to breathe. Where we get to Acts chapter 7 and the end of the chapter where we are watching as Stephen, this godly Deacon is in the process of being stoned to death. And as he's in the process of being stoned to death, he is having a conversation with none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who is standing now ready to receive Stephen at the right hand of the throne of God. It's interesting to me that now there's no talk about angels. Listen, Stephen wasn't looking or thinking about the angels. He had his eyes fixed on his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And heaven, which seemed so very far away, was right there in Stephen's face. He had his Jesus. We sang, and when it comes to die, and when it comes to die, and when it comes to die, give me Jesus. That's exactly who you get. Glory, hallelujah. But alas, again, only for God's people, only for those who have put their faith and trust in the one and only Savior, only for those sinners we all are who have turned from their sin and embraced God's one and only divine and eternal provision for your and my sin. 
Jesus Christ. Crucified, buried, and risen again. The preposition is there. It's not translated for us. With God, it's always with. Every one of his dealings is personal. And so no mistake that we're reading in Genesis 5 and verse 24 that God took him. Something else about the word translate, translated here in Hebrews 11, 5. It, it's with a view to this verse, and I'm not telling you anything you probably don't know, but it is with a view to this verse that theologians, and I believe strongly with good biblical warrant, often refer to the rapture of the church as the translation of the church. It, it's interesting to note that as one reads the narrative, it, it's impossible to not do what I'm, I'm going to tell you about. Sorry, I'm saying words to you before I should say them. It, it, it's interesting to note that as one reads the narrative in Genesis 5 concerning Enoch, And what happens to him? He's walking with God and then, boom, nothing. Where is he? God took him. It's impossible for God's people to not think of the future rapture of the church. In fact, Enoch, one moment walking with God on this earth and the next moment gone because God took him, is a perfect type of the future rapture of the church. And in fact, I can state it a little bit further. If you envision, if the typology, again, if it's there, and then if it's broader than what perhaps we initially see, it's not only a perfect type of the future rapture of the church, but in what happened to Enoch, we see the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ and also the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. I can explain both of those in a single sentence. Here's Enoch, he's walking along, there's no signs, nothing else, no other information that is given to us. He's walking with God and then all of a sudden, boom, he's gone. That's imminency. That's why if you, are, if you go someplace like Calvary Baptist and the topic is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, why that will be a, will be a prominent theme. I know that the Apostle Paul believed in it. I know that the Apostle Peter believed in it. And I know that the Apostle John believed in it. And I know that the Lord Jesus Christ believed in it. And so it's good enough for me. Any moment, Christ could return for his bride. The rapture of the church, the translation of the church. And isn't it interesting, again, reflecting on the typology, which is awesome to me, isn't it interesting that, that Enoch is taken out just before that point in time when God throws his wrath and judgment upon the world via Noah's worldwide flood. Even the pre-tribulational rapture is there. I'll tell you this, when you line up the terminology that we have, this is neat. When you line up the terminology that we have in Genesis 5.24 and Hebrews 11.5, with the terminology that we have in that classic text dealing with the rapture of the church, which is 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, the comparison is undeniable. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds 
and, and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. You're walking with God, and then all of a sudden, bang, you are caught up. Query, where did they go? Answer, Christ took them. What an awesome scene. It's the most wonderful story in the whole wide world. If I had the time, I would remind you of the significance of the term. This comes from the great Greek scholar Kenneth Weiss, whom I hold in high regard. If I had the time, I would remind you of the Greek significance of the Greek word harpazo, which stands behind our English word caught up, as in the day is coming when those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. If I had the time... I'd rehearse very quickly with you the fivefold meaning of harpazo in regard to this fantastic and wonderful Greek word that we're going to be caught up. One, it means to carry off by force. This is emphasizing the fact that you and I are living on Satan's turf. Two, it means to rescue from the danger of destruction. That's the pre-tribulational rapture. Again, if I had the time, I would remind you of this. Three, again, if I had the time, I would remind you of this. Three, to transfer, to translate a person from one place to another. That's your movement from earth to heaven. It gets no better than that. Four, to claim for oneself eagerly. This is the bridegroom coming for his bride. And five, it means to snatch out and away that sudden, again, espousing the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ, if I had the time, I'd remind you of the five-fold meaning of the Greek word harpazo. I trust this is your story. You're walking with God. You're walking with God now by faith and soon seeing him face to face. You're, you're walking with God and then boom, nothing. Where did you go? Christ snatched you. Christ plucked you. That thought I've had for about a week and a half, been looking forward to saying the following statement to you, I can't wait to be plucked. But oh, what a different and tragic story for those who are not walking with God, for those who do not know God, for those who have rejected God's Son. What a different and tragic story. I'm commending to you again the one and only Savior. I'm reminding you that we all are sinners, Romans 3.23, and our sin very effectively separates us from God, not only in this life, but the life to come. I'm reminding you of the love of God and the love of Christ, where Christ in turn came and mounted Calvary, having lived a perfect life, mounted Calvary and took upon himself your and my and the sins, of, your and my sins and the sins of the whole wide world and bore the divine penalty for it so that you wouldn't have to. I remind you in a powerful proclamation that he was and is indeed the Son of God, God in the flesh. After having been buried three days later, he rises from the grave and now has ascended on high and even now is poised and ready to return to come and capture his snatch away and pluck his bride. Jesus died for you. He bore the penalty of your and my sin so that we wouldn't have to. And the Bible invites us to receive him, John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The Bible describes Christ and his great sacrifice on Calvary's cross. Yea, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, as a gift. And there's only one thing you can do with a gift. Too precious to earn. It can only be received. Have you received Christ as your personal Savior? Has there been a point in time 
when you recognized your need of Christ because of your sin and you prayed to receive Jesus as your own personal Savior? If not, would you do that right now in the quietness of this moment? Every head is bowed. And as I lead you in a word of prayer, concluding our service, first part of my prayer is certainly appropriate for those who may be here today apart from Christ. It, 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 it's time for you to put your personal faith and trust in the one and only Savior. Would you pray this prayer with me? Lord, I've heard about you again today. I've been reminded of the fact that you loved me so much that you came to this earth. You lived a perfect life. You died a perfect substitutionary death. You, you died for me, Lord. But you didn't stay dead. You were buried and then you rose from the grave. And it's the risen Lord who is offering to me the forgiveness of sin, the gift of eternal life, heaven as my eternal home. I am praying this morning to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior. I'm praying this morning to receive Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Man, I would love to know. Not so that I can hound you. I'd, I'd love to know so I can pray for you. If you're here, here this morning, you prayed that prayer you want me to know, so in turn I can pray for you. Would you raise your hand for just a moment? I'll acknowledge a hand has been raised. And you can place it right back down. Pray that prayer this morning you want me to know. Child of God, what a powerful and ongoing call is being issued to us here and I think you understand our resolve must continue to be, God, I've, I've got to walk with you. And that's our prayer, God, help us to walk with you. Until that day, we trust soon, perhaps today, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to snatch us away. We're walking with God, and then boom, nothing. Where did they go? Christ took them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you're ready. Oh, that we be ready. For those who are, it will be worth it all. Well, let's stand together singing the first verse of 129. 129. Standing and singing together, please. Brother Kenway, would you please close us in a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we count it a privilege to have been in your house this morning. Thank you for the scripture that we've had the privilege to review for these weeks. Thank you for the testimony of Enoch and the testimony that he walked with God. We just ask that that challenge would ring true to each and every heart, that we would 
walk with you moment by moment in a walk that is worthy of the calling that you placed upon our lives. Go with us through the hours of the afternoon. We just want to say thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation, for the joy of knowing Jesus as Savior and Lord, and the truth that he's coming soon. Make that very real to each of us through the hours of this day. In Jesus' name, amen.